Museum of Industrial History. I'm Andrea Zaya, the Interim Executive Director and Curator here at the museum. How many of you have been here before? Okay, most of you, and all right, excellent. Well, we're happy to have you here. Um, today we are celebrating 75 years of cable with Service Electric Cable TV. So this is our inaugural companion program that is part of the the new exhibit that we have, New and Improved the Age of Convenience in the Home. This special exhibit, it's just about fully hands-on. So when you enjoy the space in there, please feel free to open up the drawers, sit on the couch, and it's a very atypical exhibit in that way. But bring your friends, bring your family back, and reminisce with them about past decades. So we are especially grateful for everyone who's played a, a role in putting the exhibit together and especially our, our premier sponsor, Service Electric Cable TV. They are also the 2023 Spirit of Innovation Award recipient here at the National Museum of Industrial History. So representing decades of experience, of expertise in broadcasting technology and innovation, we have our special guests with Service Electric here today, tonight. We have Director of Engineering, Jeff Kelly, and Manager of Engineering and Customer Products, Chris Kelly. I would also like to introduce our moderator this evening, Donna Acera. Donna is a special friend to the National Museum of Industrial History. She has guest curated two exhibits here at the museum, Don't Touch That Dial, which focused on radio, and our latest, New and Improved, The Age of Convenience in the Home. And Donna is a professor of communication at Northampton Community College. And among the many classes that she teaches are, is the history of broadcasting. So take it away, Donna, and can't wait to hear more about Service Electric. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So when I teach my class, the history of broadcasting, I like to kind of set up the context that the technology, the broadcast technology, was always kind of a struggle between the existing technologies and the emerging technologies. So before radio, there were newspapers. That was the technology, and then radio, you know, interrupted that, right, and changed the whole way we get news and information. And then when Radio was king of the living room, who comes in to interrupt, or, and it's television, of course, right? So then television, and it's the radio networks, it's the networks, and they, you know, they had it down pat, right? They just moved their programming from radio to TV. But not everybody could receive those TV signals. And that's where community antenna television came in. And so I'm really thrilled tonight to be, I feel like it's, it's an honoring of the 75 years of Service Electric Cable TV, their ability to persist through all of the emerging, you know, versus existent technologies, right? And they're here 75 years later. So if we're going to take you back tonight to to how it all started. But I just wanna plant a little seed in your head. Cable TV changed us as a culture. Because if you were a radio listener and then you adopted a television, it kind of worked the same way your programs were on, you know, the, they went off the air, the tele, early television networks, you know, they signed off the air, uh, the affiliates. So it wasn't a big, you know, it was easy to adopt, to adapt to that. But cable came along and suddenly we were channel surfing because there was so much more programming. And our television viewing day went from a day, it went from, you know, a couple of hours in the evening, prime time, right? To, to a 24 hour domain. You could wake up in the middle of the night, not be able to go back to sleep, click the remote, and something's on. So cable really changed us as a culture. 
Uh, it changed the way that we interacted with television. And it started in 1948 in Mahanoy City. And they've adapted up until now, 2023. They're still moving forward and progressing. So that's, I get excited about that because I like, I like to watch that dynamic, the dynamic uh, history of this. So um, I, I have a short video for you that will give you a nice little background. And maybe some of you from service, you know this history, but it's really nice to see the, the original founder and the people that were involved in setting it up and hear the story again. So we're gonna play that video and then I'm gonna welcome Jeff and Chris and they're going to share the, the history of their, uh, of their company with us. Okay, so we can roll it. It was uh, a situation where uh, when they say uh, necessity is the mother of invention, uh, that was the case uh, in my father's story. John Walson Sr. was a young man when he left his home in Pennsylvania for Chicago, hoping to become a doctor. In his pocket, $60 from his father, all the family could afford to give him. He was considering attending Loyola University if he could save enough money to pay the tuition. So he he loaded fruit on the docks and he worked as a busboy in an apartment store in Chicago. And uh, he, he actually did attend some classes at Loyola and uh, right away he discovered that the doctor thing wasn't his thing. And uh, he uh, entered into Point Electrical School, which was like a trade school of today. Walson came home to Pennsylvania, to Mahanoy City, where he got a job with PPL, married, and opened his own appliance store, Service Electric. His hot new product, television sets. The biggest problem was that anyone familiar with the terrain in Mahanoy City, Mahanoy City is completely surrounded by mountains. Before there was television, there were the mountains. And because of these mountains, what you see on television in the future may be profoundly changed. It began here in Pennsylvania when the people down in the valley of Mahanoy City couldn't watch TV programs from nearby Philadelphia. The mountains blocked the signals. And Mahanoy City definitely was down in a yeah. hole. Yeah. And you, you couldn't get a thing there. I was a blind sealer and selling TV sets at the time, and there was no way of demonstrating these TV sets. What he would do is when a customer would want to buy a piece of television, he would take the different models of televisions that he might be interested in. He'd put them in the back of his pickup truck, and he'd take the customer, and they'd drive up to the mountaintop where he had installed an antenna on the pole. And uh, he would hook the different TVs up and show them the reception so they could make the comparison. And then the customer would decide which TV they want. And uh, this became a, a laborious ritual. It became apparent that it was a lot of unnecessary work to drive people up to the tower site. So I therefore decided to bring the uh, television into the community by running the coaxial cable. And having a lot of pole line experience working for a local power company. I had the know-how on uh, installing poles and running cables. Walson drew his signals from antennas stacked up on the mountaintop. It's a technique some apartment complexes had used to feed their individual units. No one had the idea to say, hey, we can do this in an apartment building. Why can't we do it in a whole city, right? Okay, so my father, when he got the, the television reception down to his warehouse, then he used to take the people to the warehouse. Now, being that he worked for a Pennsylvania Power and Light Company, and he was a good employee, his boss lived in Monty City, by a gentleman by the name of Bob Gray, who was actually one of our first customers. And uh, he lived about halfway between the appliance store and the warehouse. So my father asked him, he says, Bob, he says, would, would you mind if I ran some wires on your poles? Because I want to get television down into my appliance store. And he says, sure, he says, you're a good employee, John. He says, you know, go ahead. He says, just, you know, keep it away from the wires. And since my dad worked for the power company, he knew how to spring wire. And so he proceeded to run this wire from the warehouse down to his appliance store. That was the next step. Well, then he had the televisions in the front window, and he had three, six, and ten. And that was a major, major thing in Monty City because no one had ever seen television in the town. People knew it existed. They visited people on the mountaintops and, and saw that it was there. But that day, uh, the chief of police had to barricade the street because everybody in the town was in front of his appliance store window 
seeing this mod, this marvelous thing called television. Uh, John had a speaker outside and used to put the sound out there and there was big gatherings outside, people watching, <laughs> watching the TV. Well, I get a lot of pleasure on accomplishing something that somebody else didn't do. And I felt that uh, I never give up the ship, so I felt that uh, cable television was a necessity. And after bringing cable television in the community of Maui City uh, and seeing the interest in, in cable television, I decided to make a, a business of it. Basically what happened was uh, the people in the crowd started, hey, Johnny, could you run that wire down to my house? You know, And uh, he said, sure, I'll run it down for you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was that type of a thing. And uh, so that's what he started to do. He, he charged the people $300 initially, and there was no monthly charge <laughs> initially. You just, you had the people actually own the cable. You, you ran the cable into their house, and they paid $300, and then it was their cable. You know, if they sold their home, they could sell it to the people that moved in. And uh, of course, that, that rapidly changed. Cable TV exploded. John Walson Sr. hooked up that first system in 1948, starting with just his own warehouse. By 1950, 14,000 subscribers nationwide were receiving cable television from 70 different systems. It was apparent that the public was interested in this, this type of reception. 75 years ago, John Walson wanted to sell more televisions. This led to the creation of an industry with the invention of cable TV. Service Electric Cable TV grew into one of the largest independently owned cable companies in the nation. His son, John Walson Jr., took cable to places his father never dreamed of. Under his leadership, Service Electric was the first to lead the way with high-speed internet, high-definition television, and the broadcasting of local sports. The Walson family legacy will live on with their dream of not creating the biggest cable company in the world, but the best. story before you saw this video. Everybody? I knew Jeff. Uh, since Jeff. I have been working here over 50 years. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Started. I started. So I got to know John. Yeah. Okay. So it came up spark in New Jersey. Yes. Oh, how fun. Yes. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. Um, so let's have a conversation, all right? I think you want to, you're going to Tell us a little bit more in detail about. Okay, so no way. Yeah. yeah. So you can't. So maybe, yeah. maybe like over here, we'll, right? We'll have to stand. Yeah. 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 We'll stand. We'll, we'll, so you pass the mic. Yeah, yeah. Do that. Why don't you first introduce yourself? Yeah. So my, my name is Chris Kelly. I'm the engineering manager at Service Electric Cable TV. I've been here for almost 25 years. It'll be 25 years in January. So uh, between the two of us, we have the 75 years coverage, just a little <laughs> over that. And I'm Jeff Kelly, I'm his father. I do admit to that. And I've been here for almost 50 years. And our other, uh, my other son, Ryan, who runs the TV studio, decided to bail on us tonight and not arrive. But uh, anyway, it's the two of us and we'll cover you. So Jim here has put this PowerPoint together for us and uh, we'll talk a little about cable TV along the way. But, uh, Chris can go on the timeline. I'm just here for the eye candy. Yeah, yeah. Some some of this uh, some of this I wasn't alive for, so uh, I'm I'm a little rusty. But obviously, um, in in 1948, like the, the video said, is 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 when it all started, and uh, it, it was basically like they said he wanted to uh, get get cable down there to uh, to uh, show off his TVs. And I always joke that there's a lot of companies that claim they were also the first, but uh, Mr. Walson charged people. At three hundred dollars, where other people would, would just hook their buddies up. So that's why I always joke that we got credit for the first. But there, there are a couple that that are in contention. Um, as as they said earlier as well, within two years, fourteen thousand people were already connected, and the uh, the industry was was booming. 
So 1955, that's, that's an, uh, a big milestone for us because that's when we moved down here to Lehigh Valley. And uh, Mr. Walson purchased the 900 customers of the Lehigh Valley South Mountain. And uh, we were officially a Lehigh Valley company in, in Bethlehem. And um, we operated mostly in Bethlehem up until, uh, we'll, we'll go through a little bit here. 1969 is when TV2 started. That was our, our local TV station that's still in operation today. It's changed a little over the years. But uh, that, that allowed us to do a lot of local origination program programming. We start, had a news program and we did a lot of sports. And, and back then, I think you could probably speak about some of the events that you did uh, you know, through the years, with, through the, the early years. Of yeah, TV2, we did bingo. That was a big thing. And you would get a bingo card, go to the Weiss or Acme or whatever it was, pick up a bingo card, and you won. We'd call the numbers, and you'd call the number on the in front of the screen, eight two one seven seven four nine, I think it was, and tell you you won bingo. But that was a big thing back then, and uh, they did live news. And then when WFMZ came along, live news we couldn't keep up with them. But the big thing coming up after that was in 1972 when HBO came to Wilkesbury. And so they brought it from microwave from New York City to Wilkes-Barre. And then Wilkes-Barre, we decided we needed it down here in the Lea Valley in like 73. So we brought a cape, coax cable all the way from Wilkes-Barre all the way down to Allentown. And it was out more than it was on for a while until we got microwave in Allentown. But that's how I got my job in 1974. They started putting all these cable boxes into people's homes, these push button Gerald's and they never figured out a way how to go get them when the people didn't pay anymore. So I was uh, a student at Central Catholic and going to Central Catholic for, and um, Votech at the time as well, they had a thing on the guidance counselor thing for the delinquent accounts collector at Service Electric and box collector. So uh, I went down and applied in uh, 1974, I think November 2nd I went in and November 4th I started. But uh, Joe Mackis, who's our vice president, who's a cousin to John Walson, was interviewed me as well as Johnny's sister, Rosalie. That's how the interview was. I stood in front of a counter for a five minute conversation or whatever. But uh, so that's what I did. I went out and originally decided uh, I was a delinquent accounts collector. And then after that, they saw I had a little bit of uh, technical expertise or whatever. So I started repairing these boxes and then in 1977, uh, someone re was leaving our company and going to work uh, at another cable company. So that's where I was just graduating from Lehigh County Community College and got a job working out in the field. But moving on past that, 1979, we're recognized as a, uh, the first cable company in the nation. And, uh, you know, we talk about that microwave dish we had up there. So 1980, we put one up at Savico. I think you have a picture in there somewhere. And it is... Um, covered by trees so we hired a contractor to cut down to a few trees we came back from lunch and they cut down like 400 trees we got fined by the township for cutting down so many trees but we did have our very first satellite dish in 1980 uh, so we could pick up HBO and then uh, uh, what you know we had amplifiers that would go from Allentown to Albertus to down to Bucks County and if there was a pole hit on say Susquehanna Street, everybody from Susquehanna all the way to Albertus would be out of cable, and then if it hit there, everybody down to Bucks County would be out in Northampton. So we decided to go to microwave and to cut down the cascade, but the only problem with the microwave, it was uh, in the 11 and 12 gigahertz range, and anybody knows about the wavelength of 11 and 12 gigahertz, it's about the size of a raindrop, so every time it rained, the microwave went out. So uh, that was a problem, but uh, yeah. moving on, our founder passed away in 1993, and then missed, we, um, after that, we met over at Moravian College, and if anybody knows Larry Kissinger, who worked for Service Electric, he was our director of public affairs, and everybody was talking about this thing called the internet, and what we could do to bring the internet to the Leia Valley. So Larry was a good friend of the people from Blue Ridge Cable who was on the board of directors at um, Moravian College. So we had a meeting there and decided all these cable companies and phone companies are gonna get together and start this company called Pentella Data to bring internet to the Lehigh Valley. So we started that company in 95, we introduced it. 
96, I think, we had our first two-way cable modem. I tried to call one of our other guys. Roger has been here forever. We introduced it. Anybody knows where the Hilton Hotel is in downtown Allentown, our very first two-way cable modem. But moving along, in 1998 is when Chris started here. So you, we introduced phone service. Yeah, so um, one, one, one thing uh, that's always been great about Service Electric, excuse me, but it's always been a very family-friendly family company. So uh, sometimes that's a good thing. Uh, but uh, one downside is I ended up working long before I was uh, actually employed there. Uh, but, you know, I got through all the, the years, I got to go up and see all everything that made all this technology work and very involved and, uh, um, you know, impressed with how it, it flourished. And then in 1998, when we got high speed internet at the house and I didn't get kicked off every time someone picked up a phone, I was just, that was it. I had to get, get in. So in January 1999, uh, I started Service Electric, my, my first job was, and I was, I was only planning on doing it for a little bit because I was more interested in pursuing a career in emergency services, and um, I was swapping out cable boxes. So in 1998, just before I started, they introduced digital cable, and it's the, this box that you get crystal clear picture, and it wasn't, inter you know, there was no interference on the analog picture, and you could get more channels, we could get, you could get music channels, and you could order a pay-per-view movie through a phone line. So I started swapping out the old boxes, putting in the new boxes, and wiring up the, the phone line so they could, they could order that. Uh, shortly after that, we started our service electric telephone where we offered telephone service through the coax. Well, one good thing about me being the guy that was hooking up the cable boxes is I knew phone wiring already. So I, I was one of the first phone installers. So then uh, you know, I had the ability to learn that side of the business which got me into working with more of the commercial customers, which kind of was the progression getting in, into engineering. But uh, it was just amazing the, pat, the pace of technology after that. Uh, in, in 2008, we became the, the founding founder, uh, boy, I can't talk to that, can I? The founding partner of the Iron Pigs, which was a, a very monumental thing for us. I mean, the Lea Valley, we didn't really have a major sports team like that yet. So, you know, we were involved in a lot of the planning of the stadium and how everything was going to get wired. And uh, obviously we got the exclusive uh, broadcast rights. So that was a very exciting time for us as well. And, um, you know, there was a lot of doubt back then as to what the future of the, the Iron Pigs would look like. And last year they got the, you know, most attendance in minor league baseball. So it's been great to be, be a part of that. The one thing that we didn't put up here, it was shortly after that, uh, this thing called high definition television was starting out. And they said, "Ah, oh, that's that's not going to be that's not going to be a big thing. You know, we don't need this high definition television." But the federal government gave the PBS stations a grant, so Lehigh Valley had one of the first um, high definition transmitters in the Lehigh Valley. And one thing that I did at the time, in addition to all the other stuff, was I worked a lot of our our home shows and and marketing events. And we said, "You know, it'd be great if we could show that you can get this high definition on our cable." So uh, my father and I were up till probably midnight one night trying to rig something up because there was one cable box that existed that you could tune the HD signal to different transmission, but you could do it on a cable channel. So like, oh, we got to do this. So we were up till you know almost midnight the one night figuring out how to do this. And the uh, at that that show we showed off high definition over cable. And I remember our competitors actually crawled under our booth because they didn't believe it. And. Uh, <laughs> Uh, after that, high definition seemed to really, uh, I'm sure everyone's, you know, probably has at least one HDTV in their house, right? So that was, um, that, that was a big, uh, big moment for us. We also were one of the first to carry uh, ESPN on high definition, so we have one of the, uh, the home plates from, uh, from that game, yeah, in our, in our uh, head end up there. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Walson, unfortunately, Oh, 2011, I forgot Wilkes-Barre. So we, we purchased Wilkes-Barre, which is one of the, part of the, the original service electrics up there, and um, they came into the family. And then unfortunately, uh, Mr. Walson lost his, his battle with cancer. So that was, uh, that was a rough year in the service electric family because he was truly involved in the company up until, until he passed, to the point where I was just was, uh, telling his uh, brother-in-law today, we're, we're just reminiscing about all the years, and uh, he would alert us to any channel issues well before a customer. 
And you know, you get a call on, at, at home or uh, in, in my day on your cell phone, the minute there was an issue, and um, you know, he expected a call back when it was fixed, no matter what time it was. So he was, he was our biggest monitor of the system. And uh, when we upgraded, did any major upgrades, he was up there helping us, teaching us. So he was a, a big part of our family and our experience at Service Electric. So that, that was a very, very tough year for us. Besides that, John didn't think of calling you at three o'clock in the morning when an idea came to his head. So he would be thinking, after we put that HD channel on, he'd call anytime, day or night. So if your phone would ring at three o'clock in the morning, it wasn't a family emergency. It was Mr. Walson calling about an idea came to his head. And then he would hang up, he would call Joe Mackus and discuss it for an hour or two. Then he'd call me back and saying, hey, I just got off the phone with Joe and this is what we thought. And then he would call our general manager, Jack, and say, hey, Jack, I just talked to Jeff and Joe. And he would go, oh. And, you know, but uh, so yeah, that's how Johnny worked. He didn't care. It was three o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the afternoon. An idea came to his head, he would call you. And one thing Chris was talking about coming to work. So, you know, I talked about 1980, we had microwave and it was on dishes and we had a, a tower up in Wind Gap by 115 and wind would come across that blue mountain at times and blow the dish off. So we'd have to be up there realigning it. So Chris and his brother Ryan were in the building and we had all these modulators picking up the New York channels and they had red lights and green lights and everything on them. So they were shutting them off. And we were, I was talking to the guys down there in the radio, they said, what's going on Jeff? All the channels are coming back, but they're going on and off all the time. I said, I don't know, let me go inside. Chris and Ryan were inside shutting all the modulators off so the lights were going. But they turned back on. <laughs> I mean, really, so, we fixed the problem. Yeah, right, exactly. So that's... Were they 25 years old or what? You left out that part. Uh, they, they were like maybe nine or 10 at the time, right, but that's that how they were. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one, of their experience. one of the things that also has um, just uh, blown my mind over the years is not only the services that we offer, but the technology that we use to troubleshoot. So in the early 2000s, like I said, we had to get phone calls when there was a channel issue. We had to drive up to the facility, replace something, unplug and, and, and plug back, plug things back in. But as we get into the, uh, the you know 2013 here, we talk about our, our SE Next product. We started getting more and more devices that you know alerted us to things not working correctly. Uh, we'd be able to troubleshoot remotely. So the ability for us to offer a better product also really helped throughout the years. So in 2013. Uh, we, we, we found this product that let us offer you um, uh, basically a multi-room DVR. You could have six streams at once. You could record six different things at the same time. You could pick things up, stop it in your, your living room and pick it back up in your bedroom, which at the time was, was you know, pretty, pretty advanced. And uh, that was kind of one of my, my first big projects. And uh, people enjoyed that so much that when they finally shut it down, was it last year, people still were, were refusing to give it up and, and switch it to our new system. So uh, that, that was a, a big step for us and uh, you know, really really put us ahead of some of our competition at the, the time. After that, the, uh, the, the Phantoms came in and we said, we're on board with that as well. They named the, uh, the Phantoms press box after Mr. Walson, the John Walson press box. So if you're ever, if you're ever over at the, the arena, you know, take a look up there. And uh, again, exclusive contract for all those, those games as well. Shortly after that, uh, we started transitioning SE Next over to the TiVo system. TiVo's uh, become a great partner of ours, and um, a, a lot of our current products and, and new products we're gonna talk about uh, have been supported by TiVo. We kind of, for a while, had both those systems going, but the TiVo really allowed us to offer uh, much more services, more hard drive space. You could control it on your app, things, things of that nature. Um, so that, that transition uh, kind of brought us into the future. Uh, in, in 2021, one of the things that came out of, uh, you know, not really a lot of sports going on is our, our local origination channel, which is at the time was called Two Sports, was kind of struggling for programming. So we had a name change to the Service Electric Network and a lot more diverse programming. So in addition to sports and music fest, there's a lot of Lea Valley um, events that they cover and uh, local programming that they were able to offer during that time. So uh, that, that was something that's carried on since then. And uh, like he said, my brother was gonna come and tell you all about the great things about SEN and then decided he didn't wanna talk. So um, he, uh, 
if you will be able to share those stories with you. But there's a whole sub separate subset of stories just tied to TV2 over the years. Um, and then lastly, the, the, you know, to keep with the innovation is one product. We kind of have soft launch right now, but it's going to be hopefully out in everybody's home early next year. That's called our SE Stream. So not only is that a next generation IP format that you can put a cable box in your, your living room, you can also use your mobile device of your choice. So if you want to watch TV on your uh, tablet, your phone, if you have a smart TV and don't want to put a cable box in there, you can watch it on that. So it's basically giving us the same, giving you, letting us give you the same content that you enjoy, but on the device you want. You're not stuck with our cable box anymore, uh, which, which will be convenient. So. You don't have to pay the cable box. Yes, and you don't have to pay the cable box rental. So, um, you know, we try to keep innovating and offering new new services. One thing that we also did not really talk too much in here is with every one of these generational changes, the internet speed substantially changed. So I think the 500K was the first modem back in 1998, and now the <coughs> highest speed we offer residentially is a gig uh, with, you know, plans to keep pushing that forward. And we always, engineer and design our system for so basically every customer gets the same experience whether it's a slow day or the day after christmas during a hurricane so we uh we try to, to offer you know the, the best internet we can as well through all this core values well we'll go back to the cable modem the first night we got a cable modem in our house in 1996 or 7 it was it was a two-way cable modem 500 kilobits download. I think I finally went to bed around midnight, but Chris and Ryan were up all night surfing the <laughs> intranet and see what they could find. That was like the half the neighborhood was over because uh, Roger uh, Schaefer, who I asked to come here tonight, has been here just as long as I have. It's amazing how many people that went to Votech, that went to Leah County Community College, followed me here. I mean, half of our uh, early employees went to Votech Lehigh County or Northampton County Community College ended up at Service Electric. So anyway, that was the big thing. We built it and every all their friends were over either from Central Catholic or Parkland looking at this new thing called the cable modem. That was the, the greatest thing. But our car, core values, it's amazing, like Chris said, how many people, we believe everybody is a part of our family at Service Electric. And uh, you know, uh, if, uh, Tracy, her daughter works here. Uh, you know, I mentioned um, earlier Larry Kissinger. Well, his daughter works here now, an uh, HR person. And then uh, that's her son, yeah, her son works here as well. So it's, it's amazing. It is a part of the family. And we have several employees here tonight also as well as working. But we talked about our commitment. Johnny, Mr. Walson, I, I uh, Met, was fortunate enough to meet Mr. Walson and Johnny, but they always taught us about core values and doing the job the right the very first time and not have to come back the second time. But we're committed to the health, safety, education, and business endeavors of the community. There's probably no one in the Leah Valley that supports so many uh, philanthropic adventures as Service Electric does. I mean, from Cub Scouts to Boy Scouts to basketball to football to um, Iron Pigs, the Phantoms, we're involved in it. We, if we, we just give them $100, we're involved in it. We believe all that stuff is important to the Leah Valley. And we're gonna continue to be the pioneer of the communication industry in the Leah Valley. And as John said there, we're maybe not the biggest, but we try always strive for the be the best in the Leah Valley. And up here uh, is our main tower up in, over in Bethlehem, Salisbury Township. And, that's our head in with all the electronics. So I'll tell you about this head in. Chris is going to blush. So it was, he knows what I'm going to say already. So Johnny said to me, you know, Chris is good at all this stuff. Maybe he should start working with it at the antenna site. So if anybody knows Chris, he always had his cell phone on. He always had his two-way radio on and his pager and his fire pager. So, and their aisles weren't that wide. So he's walking through and there was an emergency bypass button on the, the UPS uh, interruptible power system for the battery operated system if the power went out. So Chris is walking through and bumps up against this emergency stop button. The whole head in oh, went out. <laughs> Every, customer. Every customer everywhere. And we're all panicking. 
to saying what happened. And then we go over and saw that the UPS is dead. But Fred, the phone man who doesn't have a last name, says, I can fix this. He went up there and quick took, it was a piece of plastic over this cover and he fixed it so that no one else rubbed up against it to shut the whole antenna site down. But uh, that's, Chris will live with that in infinity. <laughs> But uh, so anyway, and that's our new data center and head in. It's um, as um, three generators that come on. Everything is at an A and B power for 48 volts UPS. They're in the process of moving it over. And that's our network control center. It's in Allentown and Dave in the back is one of the operators. What they do is sit there and monitor everything 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they're like the eyes and the ears of our system. And if something goes out, they are aware of it and, you know, can call the tech on call or whatever. Or if a customer has a problem at 3 o'clock in the morning or a 911 center has a pull down, they make their first point of contact is through Dave and his people down there. So, and more of our, one of our hub sites over New Jersey, Phillipsburg, it's packed with equipment. That little hub site over New Jersey is about 12 by 12, 14 building and there's like maybe $5 million of equipment sitting in there. Hmm. And that, that's the electronics, and just in one building. And uh, this is Chris's baby, he enjoys this, and uh, uh, we'll talk about. Yeah, so um, our, uh, back, back what, after we realized that we had a couple points of failure in the head end, hmm. um, we, we realized that we had to you know, be a little bit more prepared for disasters, especially Hurricane Sandy. We, we had significant, I think at one point, every one of our buildings was on some type of emergency power. Um, we had, you know, just our resources were taxed. So we committed to being more prepared for disasters as a company. And as our infrastructure grew that we were more and more prepared and we had more and more redundancy, we realized that we had this cache of equipment, we have generators, um, you know, we all kind of equipment. So we decided we'd offer that to, you know, the community. So if there was an emergency that taxed local emergency services, we could supplement that. That grew uh, exponentially in 2021 when people realized that they need a, a, a urgent Wi-Fi network set up in large parking lots for um, di different things like uh, testing and vaccination and things of that nature. So they asked us, hey guys, can you, you know, set up these Wi-Fi networks in the middle of nowhere, which, which is one of the big things that we, um, you know, said absolutely. And we, we helped, you know, the health networks and municipalities with that. Um, and another thing that we have a communication system that we maintain that works our entire footprint of Service Electric. So from Wilkes-Barre, you can talk, um, someone in Wilkes-Barre could talk to you almost in Philadelphia and from New York City almost to Harrisburg. So maintaining that gives us a little bit of expertise in, in communications. So, uh, and a lot of the people that, that work with our team uh, have emergency service experience. So we have a pretty substantial uh, communications cache we make available because one thing that happened in, even through all the years is that in emergency, a lot of these different agencies can't talk to each other. So we have a lot of equipment that we can help them with. So now not only do we, have uh, enough preparation for our own emergencies and, and disasters that might happen, but we, we help the community as well. 2014, the first experience that I remember with Eric Freeman. Oh, yes, yes, yes. The first, the first time we actually went out of our area, of our area was uh, when, when Eric Freeman was in, um, uh, in Monroe County. And we had, there was federal agencies, there was Monroe County agencies, there was uh, health networks, and they couldn't talk, so they asked if we can come up and, and give them a hand and figure out how to, to talk to each other. So yeah, that was one of our first uh, first post-Sandy events. And, uh, you know, SEN has uh, always been known for a lot of our, our Emmy-winning uh, award programming. Uh, ho hopefully everyone here has at least seen something here uh, on SEN at some point, but we have the Iron Pigs, we have the, the hockey, we cover uh, high, high school football, um, sometimes three games, on a Friday night, so everyone gets to see their 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 child, their, their grandchild playing at these sports. So um, we have a, uh, up to three channels right now in high definition, and uh, we try to cover as much in the Lehigh Valley as we can. There's also like this time of year we do holiday specials inside our studio. Where different people come in every week and record music. We go out to um, 
the symphony and, and record their, their show. So we try to get as much programming as we can. And I think that gives us a, a, a substantial advantage over um, other options that are out there because not only do you have uh, what we feel is the best internet and video package you can get, but you get a tremendous value with what we offer on, on SEN. Oh yeah, it's it's um, so so we our our equip yeah our equipment can basically say that uh, a certain amount of boxes were on this certain program at this certain time. So we can't tell who it was, what area it was. We can basically see that someone was watching, and high school football sometimes uh, has more viewers eyes on it than baseball games, like professional baseball games. So high high school football viewership in the Lehigh Valley is pretty strong so uh and with the the recent uh i think it was parkland and nazareth both doing uh quite well i believe that they were um they were almost close to football playoff uh number so it was pretty amazing and and that's only boxes that report back which is about half of them so uh, yeah yeah so that's say we have a hundred thousand boxes that report back and we have a whole another hundred thousand boxes Good numbers, 19, yeah, so um, you know that's all, all part of the package. And just one thing we didn't we didn't cover too much when we talked about our facilities is is obviously in the early 2000s we had some, uh, a single generator that powered that building, a single point of failure as as you've all been told. Uh, but now the redundancy that we offer to, to make sure the customers have the best possible product, like you saw, there's three generators at that new data center. There is um, power comes in from multiple directions. We have two massive uh, battery systems as well that keep the equipment on until the generators kick in. Uh, we have the ability to bring in portable generators. We run the fiber that feeds these buildings in from two directions. So the amount of redundancy that, that we have now that we you know didn't have previously. One thing I always joke about is back when he, he talked about the microwave days is it, it, during a rainstorm, people just be like, I can't watch TV, I've got to turn the TV off. Now if there's a glitch in the, the, the picture, we get a phone call from a customer, so uh, we have to be as redundant as possible and offer the best product as possible, and that's that's where we feel we're at today. So that's that's the system in a in a uh, glance. I'll turn the, the microphone back over to you. Wow! I know that probably most of you in the audience were aware of some of this, right? But for me, um, I'm amazed at just like how complicated and and uh, just what a huge cable company you are and the communications involved. So I'm wondering if there's anyone in the audience that has any questions for our two uh, historian experts, I'm calling them, because they certainly do have uh, all the history just no more stories about my childhood. <laughs> so you were talking about a, a change that's um, coming out next year, and that's going to give you some connectivity to different kinds of devices within the home. Uh, is is that actually going to replace TiVo, or is it in addition to TiVo? Well, there's there's actually two two different versions of it. So for for someone that likes your TiVo box, your current set top box, we'll have a box that operates on that that'll give you the same experience. So you won't notice much of a difference. The guide is the same. The only real difference for you is that your content's in the cloud, so it's not stored at your house. But if you if you want that same experience in your living room, but let's say you have a TV on out out on a patio or something that it's not convenient to get a cable to. You can also have, if it looks like the TiVo, it just doesn't need the cable box. I go to Samsung TV yes. and download the SE Stream app. And what's really nice about that is, you know, I don't know if you have a box, is your box would die, the hard drive would die, and you lose all the content. Now this, it's all in the cloud, and, you know, you, you don't lose all that good content you have. Yeah, I'm a big TiVo user myself, oh, okay. but one thing I kind of like is the fact that when I, you know, I'm not reliant on the internet necessarily like Netflix might be. Right. So I, you know, that's it still gives me the ability to watch what I've recorded. Correct. So now going to the cloud, you might lose that that's capability. All, you, well, you won't lose a capability, I mean, but the internet. The content's the still there. The content's if, the still connect, there. if the connectivity is lost, you don't have that capability. Correct. Yeah, that's the only downfall. Of that it is slightly different than just Netflix, though, because Netflix generates from from different servers on the internet. 
we have two dedicated circuits that come into our facility that will be able to deliver you those channels, um, the, even though they're IP, to our, our infrastructure directly. So it's not like if Netflix goes down or internet connection between Netflix and here goes down, you have a problem. These are dedicated circuits with those channels that are delivered to our, our facility, which right now, they're, all the channels are IP anyway. They just are converted to RF at your house. For now, they just stay IP. And what we're doing is one's gonna be in the northern part of the country and the other one's gonna be in the southern part of the country and they'll make their way to Allentown from California to bring all that delivery down. There's a backup data center in Atlanta and a backup data center in Kansas City besides the one in San Diego. So there will be three data centers and multiple circuits coming back and rolling that out. So it's not dependent on the internet it's say, but it is an IP connection. Hopefully that will never happen. So I guess I'm wondering what was the driver to uh, make and produce your own shows, your own programming channel way back when, you know? Was it just, <clears throat> was it money related? Okay, we could offer this and we can charge a little more, or is it a service to the community? And maybe you could answer that a little better. You know, what was the driver? And I'm kind of curious how that went down in that meeting room. Mm -hmm. Not that you would know, but that conversation was probably pretty interesting. I, I don't know exactly what happened, but I know Mr. Walson's commitment. He knew that people wanted to see their kids on TV. Uh, okay. And he knew that people wanted to be able to see a parade they can't get out to. And he knew people wanted to be able to watch a bingo. And then what really drove it is in Monte City, every Easter Sunday they had an Easter bonnet parade and that was our very first production at least that I was involved in we went up to Monte City at Maine and Pine and all the residents in the town came in their Easter finest with their Easter bonnet and it was a 20-minute production but that's what he believed and he believed people wanted to see their kids on TV on football games they needed local because really before WFMZ there was no local news in the Leah Valley and we had almost 10 news employees at the time back then doing live news and we in 1980 we bought a live news truck to bring news live and things like that but in 1969 uh, Congress was talking about making it mandatory for systems of more than 10,000 people but it never gained traction but I knew that you know Mr. Walson and his son were we're, we're committed to bringing local content to people, especially news, and that's how it developed. And if you, if you go over there and look, turn on Channel 4, you'll see the early days of a weather channel. Mr. Walson was mesmerized by the weather. So we had a, a weather channel on. We had a Reuters news channel on, all that stuff. He always wanted to bring people local content because he knew that they wanted more than seeing the national news, and that's what I understand. But he just kept on, as soon as he would go to the NAB show, and he would see a new color camera. And him and his son would go out there and come back and they'd say, hey, oh, by the way, guys, we have 10 new color cameras coming. And they'll be here next week. And Tracy's predecessor in accounting would say, oh, well, we got to pay for that. But uh, yeah, so Mr. Walson was always thinking of ways to keep customers on the cable system. It was money related, but not directly. It was a lost leader, I guess, as you would say. But it sounds like Mr. Walson was an innovator, too. Oh, yes. Yeah. And if you see one of those things, that's, uh, one of the shows that was put on, it's, I think part of that, when it was an oral history of cable TV, Mr. Walson talked about having two-way interactive TV back in 1969 or 70, and he talked about smell vision So I, I introduced, oh, yeah. I, I had to watch that, but uh, he, he was, he was, him and his son were both very much innovators as, as well as his, his the third generation was. Any other questions? I don't have a question, though. Comment. Well, uh, for me, growing up, um, I like to tell people that my son, my brother, likes lobster because of cable television. Mm -hmm. Because we were taken out to dinner by his wife, and I remember I got spaghetti, my brother got lobster, and her and his wife going, "You enjoyed that? Would you like another one?" <laughs> And I'm thinking, and I got spaghetti. <laughs> so he was he was involved with his both of them, his Don and his wife were involved a lot. Remember them a lot growing up. And I, my mom told me coming home one time and John's babysitting me. Yeah. Um, what happened was John had money, but they had it in Sparta on Stanhope Road. 
The guy says, I want $1,000 a month. John goes, <clears throat> I'm out. I went to a wedding. I come home. The cable TV trucks are there. Our metal shed is full of the cable stuff. So for a short time, we had the cable. Oh, we actually had the cable in our backyard until they built the head end that's there now. So that was fun. <laughs> Okay. Is that the one on Green Road? Yes. Yes, all right. Yes, all right. Yes, all right. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Can I ask a few questions? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so I had a question about that. We were talking about being able to monitor the number of people that were watching. I thought that was fascinating. Uh, so have you had uh, some other kind of events in the area that recall kind of jumped off the chart in addition, you know, other than sports events? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty average. We mostly do it for our local content, so um, I, I believe there's been talk about using it when the channel is going to renegotiate, but mostly we use it just to see what local content people want to watch and what to cover. Um, mostly I'm stuck looking at it because of my brother uh, running the TV studio, but um, you know, it's amazing how many people enjoy parades. I wonder, like music festivals, if certain uh, well, certain uh, particular artists kind of jump the viewership that. really high, oh, yeah, and fest who those well, artists might artists. be. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, music fest is very very user yeah. I mean, do you recall any of the specific artists like oh. Red Elvis is coming through town or something? No, because it, it, it looks at the the way the metadata is, and because music fest all runs together, we can't really see what okay. what what uh, band it was. I mean, we got to give the exact information to. TiVo or TV Guide, so it may not be the exact time or runs over, but we just know the numbers on a, a certain music. But uh, like, if you remember back when the Chicken Lady was here, right, and we did the Polka Mass and things like that down on Sunday morning, those numbers were like through the roof. You know, people wanted to watch the, the Polka Mass on Sunday morning. <laughs> when we were down there, was it that? Of course they yeah, did. Yeah. So yeah. It's amazing what people want to watch. Well, I applaud you for the you know the work on local events and bringing that up. So it's really great for the community. Thank you. Um, as a history of broadcasting teacher, I have a few questions for you um, uh, that that have been gnawing at me about cable and about your 75 years. Okay. So in September of 2023, Nielsen counted. 75.3 million multi-channel households. That accounts for about 60% of all TV homes that are subscribing to cable. With streaming platforms and the ability to watch content on our phones and our tablets, why do you think people still subscribe to cable TV? It's a good question, <laughs> but I'll, I'll answer it and Chris can answer, give his thoughts. But I believe one of the things is local content and people want to be able to see their kids, their grandkids watching sports. Like the other day, I was out of town during Thanksgiving and someone called me, their grandson was gonna play Scranton Prep up at uh, Northern Lehigh and he wanted to watch the TV game out in California. His nephew was playing. So I think that's how important it is to people. They can't watch it, they want to be able to watch it. They can't leave their house. Like, you know, we have all these nursing homes and things like that, and the people can't leave, so they want to be able to watch. Like, during Music Fest, you go over to Cedar Brook or Luther Crest, they're all watching that stuff. And that's what I think brings the subscribers as local content. And I, I think that's the biggest thing. Is And then the value. You figure, if you look at it, we talk about it all the time. When you add up all the prices for all your streaming apps, you're more than the price of cable TV. So I think that's is one of the things too. And Chris, you have anything to add on that? Well, I can tell you one thing from personal experience is a year and a half ago, I moved into a house that our cable wasn't quite ready yet. So I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll try this whole cord cutting, you know, experience until the cable's ready. I, I don't know how people do it. Like if you watch more than t one sport, if you like two professional sports, trying to figure out what plan or what, what to get so you can enjoy that and some other content is, um, I'm sure people do it, but it's just, it's, it's not convenient. Uh, cable has everything there. There's the, uh, you know, the, 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 all the networks that don't really have their own, they don't fit into a platform. They have their own streaming service. If you're not on cable and it was just, 
it wasn't very convenient. So uh, fortunately, that's been completed, and now I have the full enjoyment of cable again. So I think if you watch more than uh, two two professional sports, it's it's not very convenient whatsoever. And one thing to add to that, we realize that there are people that want their streaming. So I don't want to let the cat out of the bag for marketing, but. In, 2024, you're going to be able to just to buy the app to be able to watch our SEN programming. So we believe that's that the, the bag. bag. Yeah, right. The, to a small audience, right? Marketing, you didn't hear this, but uh, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. We broke the news, breaking news, but it's gonna. Uh, so you'll be able to do that. We've been working on it for a while. I know Jim and Debbie have been working. Yeah, the name it and all that stuff. Can we name it? What's it going to be called? SEN Plus. So yeah, so you heard it here first. Uh, but uh, they've been working on it for a while, just getting all the technical glicks uh, squared away. But uh, so we believe that's going to be that important to people that maybe cut the cord, but they want to be able to watch their local programming and watch their kids and football, whatever. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head because the, the biggest threat to all of us is the loss of localism in, in terms of local media. Um, so I, I'm, you know, I think that's a great answer. Uh, I had another question. After the Te Telecommunications Act of 1996, um, which allowed for companies to just gobble, big companies to gobble little, little companies and become bigger, how did Service Electric escape from being gobbled up by an MSO, a multi-system operator, a big Comcast, if you will, or something like that? How? It, we were just talking about that today, <laughs> but I think what it was, we've had, I, I know we've had multiple offers from Comcast to RCN to Cablevision, everything out, out there, and, and the Walson family said it's not for sale at any price because we employ almost 400 people in the Lehigh Valley and Wilkesbury, and all those people depend on the Walson family for their livelihood. And if they sold, you know, the first thing that would happen is three quarters of those people would be gone and they wouldn't have a livelihood anymore. So that is very important to the wall. It's, I know, you, know you, you probably just don't understand this, but to Walsons, he knows mostly everybody's names, their kids' names, and when they were born and their, all this stuff. So like on Saturday, when I was young, early on, Mr. Walson would call me to his house to do a little task or whatever. He would remember his name, but the first thing he'd want to do is sit down and he'd tell me to go into his back parlor and tap white birch beer. You know, he loved white birch beer and he wanted me to drink some white birch beer. And then after that, he would talk about nonsense. We'd get talking down to business, but that's what it was. To the, the Walson family, it was every, everybody is not just an employee. They're a person and they, uh, they want to know more about them. So that's how he, he never wanted to sell. And we're glad that he didn't, because uh, you know, because you're the only cable company, I'm sure, that can say 75 years. Blue Ridge is right behind us. Uh, what are they? 74? 74, 74. Okay, okay, yeah. but they're not 75. Right. All right. They're right behind us. In the okay. 70s. Um, this is my final question. I gotta look it up again because you made me forget it. Um, okay, so in one word. Why do you think Service Electric Cable is here today, celebrating 75 years? Why, you know, what, in one word, and you, I think you've said it already, you've said the word already, but I want Chris to think of a word too. I'd say innovation. Innovation, and I will also say fire that everybody has a fire in their belly to do what's right that's it, you know doing their best I think that's innovation and, and and perfection and that's one thing mr. Walson wanted for everybody he also wanted perfection and he didn't care how long it took you to do it but it better be done right and he wanted perfection and that's how I think we survived all these years not necessarily if it cost too much or we were over budget or whatever, but he wanted perfection. He didn't, he didn't want anything that was done haphazard. So innovation and, and perfection from the family. Wow, that, that's a fitting tribute, I think, to the Walson legacy. And um, 
I thank you very much for sharing the history with us, for sponsoring the exhibit. Um, I hope everyone now will take the time and enjoy yourself to go through the exhibit, have a little sweet to eat out there, and uh, thank Jeff and Chris very much for sharing this with us tonight.